Okay, guys. So you are now good to go. Great. Have a Thank great you. class. Okay. I appreciate Harry. Have You're a good ready. day. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, Dina. Good afternoon, Russ. How are you? Very good. Hi, Janice. Hi, Linda. Hi, Pam. Pam, you got my list, right? I did. Thank Pam you very Pam. much. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Cheryl Ann. Hi, Estelle. Hi. Hi, Joe. Hi, Jacqueline. Hi, Lorraine. Hi, Margaret. Good to see you all on this Thursday afternoon. And Joanne. Good to see everyone back again. This is a great, great program we had today. Yeah. And we have Max as our TA support. Welcome. Welcome, Max. We always we have we have great TAs here helping with our classes that get set up and tech support. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions today, you can give them to Max. Or shall I say just put them in the chat? That is the same as giving them to Max. <laughs> and I'm gonna fish out my email, add my email for you for class notes at the end, you'll get a way you can reach out directly and contact me through get set up email. I won't put that in the chat. I'll put that in the cl class notes at the end. Hi, Beverly and Leslie and Lorraine and Jacqueline and Beth. Good to see you all or have you here with us if I don't see you. I even know where a lot of you live already because you've been in the program every day and that's great. It's good to have a regular uh, regular class with one more week of Rick Steves. Does so everybody like the earth behind me? I, I really like the earth. That's isn't that the right the right thing for a class on tr on travel? Um, actually, I wouldn't mind seeing the earth from up there as long as I can get up and back well, safely. And it's Earth Day too. And it's Earth Day. Yeah. And it's Earth. Thank you. You know, I was going to say that. So, well, happy Earth Day to everybody. I like the picture behind Dina also. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, yes. I love that. Thank you. Hi, Wanda. Hi, Russ. Let's, you know, it's so funny the way 
Zoom bounces people around in the screen. So it kind of starts everyone in order and then people come in and they just jump in. So I, you know, there's Wanda and there's Estelle I haven't greeted and Jennifer and some of your names I might say twice. So pardon me, I guess you won't mind being greeted twice. Good to have you all back. And Eva, yes. Hi, Eva. Good to see Hi. you. And Janice. Hi, Janice. Got a great, great uh, video today on art in Spain. Really looking forward to showing this and to talking more about it. And hope um, that you all are ready to share, if you know, by the way, who your favorite Spanish artist is. And you know what's interesting, when we tend to, th when we think about Spanish artists, we don't necessarily think about their art in Spain. Um, and of course, some of the famous Spanish artists didn't even come from Spain, like El Greco is the Greek. So, um, you know, what is it? What is Spanish art? They lived in Spain when they made their art or like Pablo Picasso, who's Spanish, but he lived all over the place. And so it's just a fun day to uh, consider what is, what is what are the great Spanish artists? However, the art today, I think, is all art you'd see in Spain. And I spent six weeks in Spain walking across northern Spain on the Camino de Santiago, and I saw a lot of Spanish art. I mostly saw art in churches, but I saw one very famous thing, and you'll see that today. First thing, we'll give it about one more minute for folks to join in, and then I'll start. Ah, Jacqueline says her favorite is Dali. You know, I might say Dali too. It's really hard to know. Dina likes Miro. Um, how many people have seen the film Midnight in Paris? If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Yeah. And one of the things that I love about the film, besides many, there's so many things I love about it, but one thing is these famous artists and writers and musicians from the 20s who appear in the film, not, you know, someone playing the artist. And the, my favorite one is the guy who plays Dali. He is really good. Yeah. Guy travels back in time to the 1920s and he meets Ernest Hemingway oh. and F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. And oh gosh, who someone who's seen it remind me all the people he's he meets there. Um, um who's a musician? Uh oh, he meets um uh, the poet, E.E. Uh, e. E. Cum is it E.E. E. Cummings he meets? No, wait, it's, um, anyway, he meets, who? T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot, yes, Ty, Tom Eliot, he says, yes, that's a good one. And he meets the famous uh, musician, uh, he uh, is Porter, Cole Porter. Uh, oh, it's a fun film. It's a fun film. If you haven't seen Midnight in Paris, I recommend it a lot. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start here. I know some more folks will probably join us in a little bit. Uh, Jacqueline says it's one of her favorite films. You know, when you want to pick me up, I just watch that film. It's, it's so entertaining. And uh, the cinema, cinema, cinematography of Paris, I think it's in April, is absolutely gorgeous. So it's really, really well done. Let me do a screen share here for you. Nope, that's not the right one. There we go. So this is Art Thursday, and you should be seeing something that says Art Thursday, Vibrant Art of Spain. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. That is yes. uh, a, a Gaudi, which is less known. It is not as famous as the 
Sacra, it says Sacra Familia in Barcelona. This is the bishop's residence in Astorga. And Astorga is one of the famous towns or cities along the Camino de Santiago. It's about a two day walk from Leon. And it is just a gorgeous building. The left of it is the cathedral in Astorga, which is also a gorgeous film. Uh, gorgeous building, pardon me. I'm Russ Eanes, your guide. I'm from Harrisonburg, Virginia. We're having a bit of a chilly day here. Um, somebody ordered the wrong weather. This is supposed to be April 22nd, Earth Day, and it was uh, down into the low 30s. And I think it's supposed to get even cooler tonight. Anyway, we'll be back up in the 70s and 80s in a few days. Uh, more temperate weather for me. I'm a writer, a walker, and a cyclist. I formerly was a book publisher where my favorite thing was to help authors shape their ideas into a book. I'm now a full-time guide with Get Set Up where I really love working with older learners and I enjoy uh, all the wisdom I collect from you and, and the energy I get from teaching these, from doing these classes. Uh, Get Set Up helps you learn useful skills from people like you so you can do wonderful things. We learn from each other. So ideally we can see you and your cameras are on. You may request a recording after class of this. You just contact help at getsetup.io. And if you are joining by live stream and there are a lot of people out there today joining us by live stream, the best way to participate is to join us and register for a class. Then you get to be here live and you can offer your opinions or ask your questions. By the way, Get Set Up's not paid to promote any specific products. We're strictly an educational organization. We're celebrating Rick Steves this month. I guess that's the way we could put it. He came to Get Set Up on April 13th. That was like a week and two days ago. We're going to continue with Rick Steves for the rest of the month. You know, he does lots of videos. Someone asked me last night why he stopped making videos, and I don't have the answer to that yet. But um, you can see Rick Steves. He'll be on, I believe, this evening at 9 p.m., Let's see, I gave the time yesterday. Let me check that out. Um, yes, he will be 9 p.m. this evening. You can watch again the interview with Rick Steves. It was great. I really recommend it. And he'll be on tomorrow at 6 p.m. So you can watch that if you missed it the first time. Uh, he spoke in the interview and in a podcast, which I can recommend to you called I Built This, the National Public Radio podcast with Guy Raz, uh, about the difficult year he had in 2020. And anybody I know, and I know quite a few people who are in the business of conducting tours or writing guidebooks for travel, and they all took a huge hit last year. And Rick Steves, to his credit, did not let his staff go. He kept them all on. Uh, and when he was asked about that in a, in a newspaper interview, he said, our mission is to inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando. By the way, he says that in the interview that he did uh, with Lawrence on Get Set Up. We owe it to our mission to still be around after this is done, he means after the pandemic, so America can be less fearful and open to the world with a mindset of building bridges instead of building walls. And that's something I really love about Rick. He, he helps open our minds and our hearts and uh, to other experiences. So we are um, not fearful of others, but appreciate others. And I really like the way he helps us find an appreciation for other cultures. We are starting an upcoming, uh, a lot of uh, regular travel series coming up. We'll be talking about more destinations. Let's see, a week from Monday, uh, Frank and Joanne Collar, who have been regular uh, attenders to these Rick Steve sessions, will be talking about their trip to Cuba in 2019. So that's a great one. We're also going to be doing some classes on active travel. That's what I call travel by foot, pedal, or paddle, you know, where you, you, you power yourself along the travel. We'll be doing lots of classes on practical travel tips, and already some of those uh, have started already. So keep an eye out. If you go to my, uh, if you go to Get Set Up and you put in Russ's name in the search, you can come up with all the classes I do on practical things or anything else. We'll also be doing some um, talking some about alternative travel, things like house sitting, work away, uh, road scholars, and also being lots of sessions on history, food, culture, and art around the world, the kinds of things we appreciate when we travel. 
I'm going to pause here one second and reshare so that I can show you the Rick Steves video. And make it look good for your screens. And we'll find Rick who has, oh, Rick is over here. The Art of Spain, Rick Steves classroom. The 19th century was a boom time for Barcelona. By 1850, the city was busting out of its medieval walls. A new town called the Eixample, or expansion, was planned to follow a grid-like layout. Wide sidewalks, graceful shade trees, chic shops, and plenty of Art Nouveau frills make the carefully planned Eixample district a refreshing break from the dense old city. Building corners were snipped off to create light and spacious eight-sided squares at every intersection. The vision of the Eixample was to have everything equally accessible to everyone. Each district of about 20 square blocks would have its own market, hospital, schools, park, and daycare. While the original vision was an egalitarian one where each zone was equal, the Eixample became an architectural showcase for its wealthy residents. While adhering to height and width limitations, they built as they pleased, often in the trendy style of the day, Modernisme. Modernisme is the Catalan version of Art Nouveau, which flourished across Europe in the late 19th century. Barcelona was the capital of Modernisme, and especially here in the Eixample, it shimmers with its characteristic, colorful, leafy, flowing, and blooming shapes. Several of Barcelona's top mansions line the boulevard Passage de Gracia. Because the structures look as though they're trying to outdo each other in creative twists, locals nicknamed this stretch the Block of Discord. Barcelona is an architectural scrapbook of the galloping gables and organic curves of the most famous modernista architect, hometown boy Antoni Gaudí. His Casa Milà is Barcelona's quintessential building from this era. Casa Milà is open to the public. It shows how the organic sensitivities of modernista architecture flowed into the domestic world. This apartment would have been rented by a wealthy businessman. It shows how the affluence of the industrial age was enjoyed on a personal level, at least by the upper class. Now an apartment could be a small palace. Gaudi's most famous work is his unfinished Church of the Holy Family, or Sagrada Familia. He worked on it for over 40 years until his death in 1926. Work continues on the church, which is not expected to be completed for another 50 years. The Nativity facade, the only part of the church essentially finished in Gaudi's lifetime, shows the architect's original vision, mixing Christian symbolism, images from nature, and the organic flair of modernisme, it's an impressive example of Gaudí's unmistakable style. The more modern passion facade has a different, yet complementary style. In the soaring nave, Gaudí's columns blossom with life. Gaudí was a devout Catholic. Part of his religious vision was a love for nature. He said, nothing is invented, for it's written in nature first. His little windows let light filter in like the canopy of a rainforest, creating space for an intimate connection with God. Stepping into this monumental construction zone, visitors see the slow and steady progress and what their steep admission fee is funding. Like the construction of great churches through the ages, this project takes many lifetimes. Gaudí knew he'd never see it finished, as do the architects working on it today. Yet they all contribute, pushing steadily toward completion. Someday, a central 550-foot tall Tower of Jesus will rise above all this. It'll dwarf everything we see today. The vision? To shine like a spiritual lighthouse, visible even from out at sea. If there's one building on Earth I'd like to see, it's Sagrada Familia. 
finished. For a more playful dose of Gaudi's architectural genius, we're heading out to his colorful Park Guell. While today the grand stairway and its welcoming lizard are overwhelmed by fun seekers, Gaudi intended this 30-acre garden to be a 60 residence housing project, a kind of gated community. Fanciful viaducts complement the natural landscape. Gaudi actually lived in this mansion. As a high-end housing development, the project flopped. But a century later, as a park, it's a huge success. As you wander, imagine that the community succeeded and you were one of its lucky residents. Here at the Hall of 100 Columns, the intended produce market, you'd enjoy the fanciful columns and decor while you did a little shopping. Heading home, you'd stroll down the playful arcade. Like a surfer's perfect tube, it's another nature-inspired Gaudi fancy. And on such a beautiful day, you'd sit a spell on Gaudi's ergonomic benches to enjoy a grand view of this grand city. I'm gonna pause for one second, everybody. Just uh, the video didn't play full screen. So I'm gonna just go check that out one second and get that so it works for us all. Sevilla's passion for religious art is preserved and displayed in its music. Well, I apologize. We're not going to get full screen on that today, and we'll continue on with it, however. Museum of Fine Art, the Museo de Bellas Artes. The top Spanish artists, Velasquez, Mario, Zubaran, all called Sevilla home. Sevilla was Spain's commercial and material capital. It's New York City, while Madrid was a newly built center of government, like Washington, D.C. In the early 1800s, Spain's liberal government disbanded many of the monasteries and convents, and secular fanatics were looting the churches. Thankfully, the most important religious art was rescued and hung safely here in this convent-turned-museum. Spain's economic golden age, the 1500s, blossomed into the golden age of Spanish painting, the 1600s. Artists such as Francesco de Zuberan combined realism with mysticism. Under a protective Mary, he painted balding saints and monks with wrinkled faces and sunburnt hands. This inspirational style fit Spain's spiritual climate during an age when the Catholic Church was waging its counter-reformation battle against the Protestant rebellion. The Apotheosis of St. Thomas Aquinas is considered Zurbaran's most beautiful and important work. It was done at the height of his career, when stark realism was all the rage. Zurbaran presents the miraculous in a believable, down-to-earth way. Eventually, the soft and accessible style of Bartolome Murillo became more popular than Zurbaran's harsher realism. Murillo became the rage in Spain and through much of the Catholic world. This Madonna and Child shows how Murillo wraps everything in warm colors and soft light. Murillo's favorite subject is the Virgin Mary, shown young and pure. The painting is called The Immaculate Conception, one of dozens Murillo painted on this subject. Catholics believe that not only was Jesus born of a virgin, but that Mary herself was completely pure, conceived immaculately. Toledo's main square is the inviting Plaza Zocodover. Tourists visit today for more than marzipan. Toledo was the 16th century home of one of Europe's greatest painters, El Greco. Born in Greece, trained in Venice, Dominikos Theotokopoulos, his tongue-tied friends nicknamed him the Greek, or El Greco, moved to Spain to find work as a painter. He found employment here in Toledo, where he spent the rest of his life and developed his unique style of painting. El Grecophiles will want to visit Toledo's Santa Cruz Museum. Originally an orphanage and hospital, 
Today it's Ward's Howe's 16th century art, including a superb collection of El Greco paintings. His work mixes influences from all three of his places of residence, icon-like faces from his Greek homeland, bold color and twisting poses from Italy, and the almost mystical spirituality from Catholic Spain. El Greco painted supernatural visions, elongated saints stretched between earth and heaven. He painted souls, not bodies. Faces flicker like candles. Thoroughly modern in its disregard of realism, his art feels contemporary even today. This altarpiece, finished one year before El Greco's death, is the culmination of his inimitable style. It combines all his signature elements to express an otherworldly event. While on Earth, the city of Toledo sleeps, a vision takes place overhead. An angel in a billowing robe spreads his wings and flies up, supporting Mary, the mother of Christ. She floats through warped space to be serenaded by angels and wrapped in the radiant light of the Holy Spirit. Mary is charged from within by the ecstasy of her faith. No painter before or since has captured the mystery of the spiritual world like El Greco. Nearby, the simple chapel of Santo Tome holds El Greco's most loved painting. The burial of the Count of Orgaz couples heaven and earth in a way only the Greek could. Imagine you're at the burial of the good Count right here in this chapel. He was so holy, two saints even came down from heaven to help out. The funeral is attended by Toledo's leading citizens. Each face is a detailed portrait. El Greco paints himself looking out at us, drawing us into the scene. The boy in the foreground, pointing to the two saints, is El Greco's son. The Count's soul, symbolized by a ghost-like baby, rises up through the mystical birth canal to be reborn in heaven, where he's greeted by Jesus, Mary, and all the saints. A spiritual wind blows as colors change and shapes stretch. Jesus points to St. Peter, who controls the keys to the pearly gates. The painting's subtitle, Such is the reward for those who serve God and his saints. Our hotel, the Residencia La Almazara, while truly in the country, is just two miles out of Toledo. The summer residence of a 16th century cardinal, it's a lumbering old place with inviting public spaces, a sprawling garden, and simple but comfortable rooms. Fond of the Cardinal, and perhaps this view, El Greco hung out here for inspiration. For a radically different slice of Catalonia, we're heading north up the Costa Brava. The town of Figueres has the Salvador Dali Museum, the essential Dali site. Ever the entertainer and promoter, Dali personally designed, decorated, and painted it to showcase his life's work. He was buried right here in the floor of this room in 1989, and the museum serves as a mausoleum to the artist's creative spirit. When Salvador Dali was asked, are you on drugs? He replied, I am the drug. Take me. Dali produced some of the most thought-provoking and trailblazing art of the 20th century. His surrealistic imagery continues to disturb and intrigue to this day. The best known of the surrealists, Dali created photorealistic images set in bizarre dreamscapes. His life changed forever in 1929 when he met an older Russian woman named Gala. She became his wife, muse, model, manager, and emotional compass. An audience of golden statues looks down on the museum. Above Dali's personal 1941 Cadillac hangs the boat enjoyed by Dali and his soulmate, Gala. When she died, he was devastated. Below the boat drip blue tears. Squint at the big digital Abraham Lincoln, and he comes into focus. Look closer, and you see Abe's facial cheeks are Gala's other cheeks. The homage to Mae West room is a tribute to the sultry seductress. 
Dolly loved her attitude. She was to conventional morality what he was to conventional art. Facial features are furniture, arranged so that from the intended vantage point, everything comes together. Mae West. The ceiling of the lounge is a highlight. It shows Gala and Dali as they reach for the heavens. Dali's drawers are wide open and empty, indicating he gave everything to his art. Dali enjoyed his most creative years nearby in the fishing village of Cadiquais, which has long been a haven for intellectuals and artists alike. Its craggy coastline, sun-drenched colors, and laid-back lifestyle inspired artists from Matisse and Duchamp to Picasso. For today's tourists, Melo Cadiquais offers a peaceful beach town escape near Barcelona. In the 1920s, Salvador Dali and Gala moved in, bringing international fame to this sleepy Catalan port. Casa Dali shows how a home can reflect the creative spirit of an artistic genius and his muse. His studio was equipped with an innovative easel. It cranked up and down to allow the artist to paint while seated, as he did eight hours a day. The bohemian yet divine living room comes complete with a mirror to reflect the sunrise onto their bed each morning. Like Dali's art, his home defies convention. And like the artist himself, it's playful and provocative. My apologies, we weren't able to see that on full screen, everybody. I still hope you were able to appreciate it. Um, I particularly loved Dolly. Uh, that was quite an unusual collection that he has. I love what he did with his home. Um, I first was encountered Dolly. My brother was an artist and uh, a very good artist. And he took me on a tour of the Art Institute of Chicago when I was uh, 13 and explained all sorts of things to me. French Impressionism, which uh, the Art Institute has the best collection of French Impressionists outside of France, uh, at least it used to. And also showed me surrealism and tried to explain it to me. And I can still remember seeing the Salvador Dali's there and uh, the trying to imagine what they meant, uh, but looking at his house and, and the way he expanded his art into the architecture of his house is quite amazing. Uh, any, who has some comments or thoughts about what we saw about art in Spain today? Go ahead and just raise your hand or you can raise a virtual hand unmute yourself. We don't have that big of a class today, so go ahead. Yeah, I think I'm just as fascinated with the architecture as the art that they were showing, especially in the very beginning. Yes, you say same thing with, Ga with Gaudi, mm -hmm. uh, his, his architecture, yes. I love that housing uh, development that he designed. Amazing, uh, just amazing. The, um, the video must have been a few years old because the um, La Sagrada Familia is, it, is um, the altar has actually been consecrated and it's, it's more finished than what we saw in that video. It's, it's, it's further down the road than, than, um, than when that video was made. You're right, Susan. In fact, I think um, until recently, it, it wasn't even roofed completely. And I understand now that the roof is complete, which also gives us a sense of how in the Middle Ages, they would build these cathedrals that might take 150 years to build and they, wouldn't, and they would uh, not have the roof on right away. And they would have to get to a certain point where they would have a roof on, they could consecrate the altar, that's right. Gaudi's intent was to uh, make a, um, a Gothic, construction without buttresses and instead he used those those internal columns are like trees 
yeah. um, a form of nature, and and those are those buttress the roof. Yes, that's amazing. That is amazing. I was there two years ago, and the interior, I mean, the exterior is amazing, but the interior is so beautiful, and the light that comes through the, the windows and the different colors, depending on how the sun hits, it was just fantastic, unforgettable. That's right. He, all, he designed that for how, and as, as all cathedrals are designed for sunlight, for how they affect the building. And he did that in that building. Yes. Who else wants to share about an experience you've seen or the art of any, any of those artists that he, they mentioned? They did mention Picasso, who might be the most fa famous Spanish uh, artist, but that's okay. We really got a lot of information about a lot of different things. And uh, I, I found it amazing how much could be condensed into this short video. And I saw the Mae West uh, lips, uh, lip sofa. He also has a museum in uh, Brighton. There's a Dolly Museum, England, Brighton in England. And they- That's right. Have, I, I, they also have you have been there, that, Estelle? Yes, many, many years ago. And they also have the uh, red lip, I didn't, I didn't remember that it was Mae West or, yeah, I didn't remember it was Mae West. Oops. But uh, there was so much information really in one condensed thing. It's amazing, amazing. Do you know if, the, if any of those museums have been um, re, uh, redone or whatnot because I, I was in those museums when I was much much younger and they, I just don't remember them looking quite so bright and light but maybe maybe they always were and I just didn't notice because I was so young I didn't pay attention but they looked like they were newer remodeled. Who's been there that can answer that? Well I know that there's um I've been to Spain several times and I know that um there is recent um construction, but I don't think it's renovation. I think it's additions being made to the Prado in, uh, in oh. Madrid. Uh, the Reina Sofia uh, Museum is, um, you know, it's, it's a fairly, it's a newer museum. That's where uh, Picasso's Guernica is, is located. I stood in front of that painting. That was the most awesome experience I think I've ever had oh, looking at it. Yeah, I was surprised it wasn't in the video. He didn't show it, did he? He didn't show the Guernica. No, right? no. He yeah, didn't yeah. He, he has some separate segments on Picasso and uh, okay. you know what we'll do. I'll keep that in mind and uh, maybe not next week, but sometime in May or June, I'll pull that one up and we'll look about Picasso because he has a whole segment about Picasso in Spain. You'd have to really, there's so much. I mean, I've seen the Granica too. And it, it was, like she said, it, you could stay there all day. And look at Did it. you say that's in Madrid? I, it's, yeah. in the, it's in the Reina Sofia uh, Museum in, in Madrid. It was at the, uh, at the Met in New York until I think 1987 or thereabouts when they transferred it back to Spain. Picasso's um, wish in his last testament or whatever, I mean, he, he uh, didn't want that going back to Spain until Franco was gone. And oh, Franco, no kidding. Away, that's that's right. And then Franco passed away in 1975. And then over the years, they made arrangements to return the painting to Spain. Oh my gosh! You know that that's a very important point. And um, Guernica is, if we, can you call it a favorite painting? Is one I find one of the most mo moving paintings ever since I first saw it. And when I was in Spain, walking the Camino de Santiago, there were images of there were sections of Guernica in Pamplona. Uh, kind of like street art. <clears throat> and of course, that's in the Basque region of Spain, not that far from, from Guernica itself. Mm. Uh, but that's a very good point um, about him not wanting to have it back in Spain while Franco was still alive, because it's a very powerful political statement against um, the, the Francoism and the Civil War. So I, I would like to see that one day and I would like to, to be like the two of you and stay in, stand in front of it for a long time. Yeah. 
anyone else got some experiences with any of those artists or an artist that perhaps wasn't mentioned, a Spanish artist? It didn't mention uh, Goya or Velasquez. And, or, well, they did mention Velasquez, but uh, Goya, um, who um, painted around the time of the Napoleonic Wars. And he was, uh, he was a very, inter very interesting character himself. Mm -hmm. So he mentioned um, right at the very beginning, I think, of the first video about um, the first Spanish Republic in the early 19th century, about how they dissolved a lot of the monasteries. And of course, Spanish history is quite fascinating. Um, I think I've recommended in other classes, I'm trying to think what, other, what, what else we've done on Spain, uh, the book, The Ghosts of Spain, written by Giles Tremlett, a, a British uh, journalist, which uh, is kind of a tour of, of modern Spain and really opened my eyes to all the very different regions of Spain, how they're not the same. And uh, also a lot about how the Spaniards are trying to figure out how to talk and come to grips with their civil war. Um, well, at this point, 70 to 80 years after it happened. And it's a very good book. Uh, I'll, I'll try to remember to put that book in the in the class notes, The Ghosts of Spain. I've also picked up another book recently about Spain. I'll I'll put that title in the class notes. And I will keep note, I will note that we should watch on another Friday or Thursday um, about Picasso in Spain. And that, that Rick Steves in particular mentions uh, the period in which Picasso came back to Spain after the Second World War and painted. That, that's what that video is about. So I'll, I'll look that one up and see if we can put that into a Thursday segment. An interesting historical read for anyone who's a, a history buff is uh, George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia. Mm -hmm. he, he actually went to um, Catalonia during the war and, fought and participated, I guess you could say. That's right. That's a very good book. I wanted uh, to mention when I was uh, in Dali's house outside of Barcelona, um, you had shown the picture, or Rick Steve showed the pictures of the lips, you know, and uh, the eyes and all of that. In in bag of that, um, it, there was like a, a thing you could stand behind that, um, and you looked through like eyeglasses, and it showed, I mean, it looked just like. You know, it was like this optical illusion that he had created. But when you first walk in, you just see all these separate pieces. But then you go behind the stage and there were these eyeglasses that you looked through and it, and it looked like a face. It was really interesting. Oh, like a face. Oh, and the whole museum, the whole museum was absolutely bizarre. I can't even begin to tell you. Things were in the strangest places and curves and, you know, uh, everything. I was pretty amazed. I took a lot of pictures and spent pretty pretty much a full day there. But it, it's a lot to see. But I'm glad I did it because it was outside of Barcelona. I'm glad I took the time to do it. And uh, it was well worth it. But um, I just wanted to mention that, that if you ever go to Barcelona, it's well worth. I just took a train out there and uh, it was really well worth it. Great. Let's see, did you put the name of that museum in the chat? Was that the? Dali Museum, I think. Yeah, I, I just think of it as the Dali Museum. I, okay. I, it's probably got another, but the name of the city, I think is Figuries or something like that. Mm -hmm. I have a case, it looked like C-A-D-A-Q-U-E-S. Okay. Sada case. Oh, Where his home is. And that's what you're referring to, Jacqueline? Uh, I, I can't remember. I just know it was the museum and okay. I, took the train, I took the train there. It's a miracle I got there. Okay. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I thought I was going to be able, I took a Spanish dictionary. That was just a joke because everybody spoke Catalan there. Yeah. Catalan, right. Spoke Spanish. And I, nobody told me that. And I got there and it was like, I mean, the taxi driver just said, no, no, you, you know, you can't use that dictionary. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm in such trouble here. But, but I, I really didn't realize that. A whole different language. It might not be like that now, though. It might have changed. 
I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, they're very, proud, they're very proud, you know, of their. They're their, very proud of their language. Yes. 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 I think it was are. just in the news again that they're trying to secede. Wasn't it a year or two ago? I think they were. They I did. Guess, they had a vote. I, yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember that. Hmm. I know the artist, the other artist that was thinking about is Miro. Miro's all over Barcelona. There's a museum. Um, I don't, I don't think the hill, it's not Montjuic. It's the other, the other hill overlooking the harbor. And there's a museum there of, of his works. And there's a huge sculpture, I guess, of that Miro made right, in, right along the water there. So he's a huge presence, I think, too, in Barcelona. Whoa. And the public art in Barcelona is just beautiful, too, especially around the harbor area. Just yeah. very innovative. Yeah, it's a beautiful city. It is. That's a place I haven't been to yet, but would like to get to. Probably sometime I'll go in the off season. That's a good idea. If there is an off season, but I have had friends who've gone there in January and they said it wasn't crowded and it was actually quite nice. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, it gets pretty hot in the summer, so the January might be might be nice. Mm -hmm. So as far as the art in general in Spain, I don't recall any Impressionism. That just didn't seem to to migrate over there. Is that true? Am I remembering that right? There's an artist, uh, his name is, uh, was uh, Soroya. And there's a small museum um, in a house that he actually, I, I think he actually owned the house or something anyway, it's a small museum. He was an impressionist and he's well known there but he's not well known worldwide. But it's S-O-R-O-L-L-A, I think is how his, his uh, name is oh. spelled. Okay, I'll have to look in. Well, that's a very interesting point, Pam. Um, and it also points out how certain uh, artistic movements can be centered geographically. So Impressionism would be in, Fr in France. And when you have Americans who painted anything that was similar to the Impressionists, it's because they were in, in France mm. at the time. And yeah. uh, So it's like they leapt over um, Impressionism straight into Picasso and Dali. Yeah. Modernism and Surrealism. My brother explained to me that Surrealism is the juxtaposition of, of disconnected elements. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Even, or con contradictory or disconnected elements. <laughs> That's the only way I've been able to describe it my whole life still. I still feel the same thing about it. Yeah, that's that's a tough one for me to to really like, but I, I really do appreciate the the idea of it. Like it's nothing I would hang in my living room. That's just not my right. thing. But you you know, I, I I do get that it's very unique and and you can learn a lot from it. <laughs> it's thought provoking. Yes, yes, exactly. And Rick Streeves referred to dreamlike elements. I thought that was a, an eloquent way to try to put it. Well, I, I'm def, I've definitely taken notes. We'll try to find the segment of Picasso. We'll do an, an, an art Thursday in Spain with Picasso. And I've also written down Sorolla and Miro to see if he's done anything on those. Or uh, perhaps someone else has, uh, because one thing that has happened in the last year is a lot of museums have become virtual because people can't go to them. So we may be able to find some virtual museum tours that we can do of art. Yeah. Oh, yeah. trivia question. Who was the um, recent filmmaker who was inspired by the figures in Casa Mila? No idea. Tell us who, Susan. It was Spielberg. If you think about the the guys on the on the roof in Casimila, you're looking at a um, a Star Wars figure. Ah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Very good. 
I think I've heard that before. And can anybody suggest any recent Spanish films? Um, if you can put them in the chat, I'll pick those up. I've got a few in mind myself that I'll try to put in the class notes. Um, I, I particularly enjoyed. Um, and there's one that is available on Netflix. And I think it's called 100 Days of Solitude. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen that. I'll check it out. It's a beautiful film about a, a, a man who goes into the mountains in northern Spain for 100 days of solitude. Very beautiful. Spain, Spain in Two Trenches is a, more of a documentary movie about the Civil War, the Spanish Civil War. Um, uh -huh. I don't know anything. It's, it's, it looks like it's gotten a lot of awards, but I haven't, looked, I haven't watched it myself. But Spain well, there in is Two also Trenches. There is also, I'm not sure if it's the same one, there is a documentary done more recently um, about the Spanish Civil War and about remembering. I'll see if I can find that the might name. Be. Yeah, I, I've maybe it is. It was done in Spanish and um, mm. I, I feel like it came out in 2019. So uh, I'll find out how widely available that <coughs> is. I'll look okay. that one up, Spain in Two Trenches. Yeah. What was the movie about Paris that you said in the very beginning? Midnight in Paris. I thought so, but I wanted to check. Can you put that it's, in the notes too? I will. My mind is um, It's going. directed by Woody Allen, but it stars... Um, Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson, who is yeah. just absolutely fabulous. And what's his girlfriend's name? I don't remember. Uh, Abigail Adams, I believe. Is it okay. Abigail Adams? Okay. I don't, I don't Amy, know. Amy Adams. Was Amy that? Adams. Thank Amy you. Adams, okay. <laughs> Amy <laughs> Abigail Adams was a wife of a president. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think she made the film. <laughs> <laughs> Amy. Uh, yeah, Amy. Uh, thank you very much. And then, Absolutely he, hilarious. Beautiful film. Go ahead, was, Dina. And didn't he meet an actress, you know, that he sort of hung out with? And I'm trying to remember who that was. I'm going to need to go back and watch the movie. Again. I can't remember her name either. Um, he, 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 he also meets Gertrude Stein. Right. And uh, yeah, the Fitzgeralds. Uh, F, uh, my, I actually love the Hemingway figure was really, really, really good. The guy that played Hemingway. Oh. And uh, it is just delightful. If you need a pickup, just watch a uh, Midnight in Paris. Uh, when uh, my, my daughter, my youngest daughter is a big fan of the movie and she went to Paris with my wife and me in 2013 for a few days. And um, we made sure that we found the spot where Owen Wilson sits on the steps at midnight and the car pulls up and picks him up. And there's a picture of me sitting on those steps and of my daughter. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a famous spot. It's on the left bank, it's not very far away from, from the, the old, that, 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 that's the uh, Latin Quarter. So it's uh, a lot of fun, just a fun movie. Well, you've been a great group um, and our time's about up. Tomorrow we have, um, history in France. So please come back and join us for that. The next, we've got one more week of Rick Steves, and then we've got some different travel classes that will be starting up the week after that. But we'll also be doing some classes with learners in May. Uh, Frank and Joanne Collar will be here uh, May 3rd to, to share with us about Cuba. Uh, the following week, May 11th, we have um, another learner who's going to talk to us about hiking and doing walks for people that have limited mobility, which is going to be a great topic. She's someone who had been paralyzed several years back, has regained part of her motion, but not all of it. And so she's written several books on walks that are like two miles or less in Massachusetts. She's going to come and share her story with us. So we've got lots of great things lined up and some really good guest speakers who I can't reveal yet who are coming in May but we'll be continuing on with uh, travel classes during the day and in the evenings or late afternoon like this. So uh, just keep an eye out and I'll, I'll um, we're, we're doing a lot more where you can um, 
uh, and maybe in a week or two, you'll be able to see before a class starts upcoming classes that I'm doing on travel. And then at the end, you'll be able to catch those so you can find those to sign up for them, also share them with friends that you know would enjoy them. And I, I will uh, get my guide email to you at the end. So if you have any suggestions for classes, please reach out to me, anything you'd like to see us cover, anything you'd like to help with, something you wanna tell about, I'd love it. And uh, I'll hopefully see some of you tomorrow. So have a good rest of your day Thursday. And we'll see you. Thanks, Russ. Thank you. Great. Thank right. you. Thanks.